Chapter 1, Section 2. How libertarian is right libertarian theory? The short answer is not very. Liberty not only implies but also requires independent critical thought. Indeed, anarchists would argue that critical thought requires free development and evolution That's and that this is precisely which capitalist hierarchy crushes. For anarchists, a libertarian theory, if it is to be worthy of its name, must be based upon critical thought and reflect the key aspects that characterizes life, change, and the ability to evolve. To hold up dogma and base theory upon assumptions as opposed to facts is the opposite of a libertarian frame of mind. A libertarian theory must be based upon reality and recognize the need for change and the existence of change. Unfortunately, right libertarianism is marked more by ideology than critical analysis. Right libertarianism and thus so-called anarcho-capitalists are characterized by a strong tendency of creating theories based upon assumptions and deductions from these axioms. For a discussion on the pre-scientific nature of this methodology and its dangers, see the next section. Robert Nozick, for example, in Anarchy, State, and Utopia, makes no attempts to provide a justification of the property rights his whole theory is based upon. His main assumption is that individuals have rights and there are certain things that no person or group may do to them without violating their rights. While this does have its intuitive appeal, it's not much to base a political ideology upon. After all, what rights people consider as valid can be pretty subjective and have constantly evolved during history. To say that individuals have rights is, open up to, is to open up to the question, what rights? Indeed, we will argue this in greater length in section two. Such a rights-based system as Nozick desires can and does lead to situations developing in which people consent to being exploited and oppressed that intuitively many people consider supporting the violation of these certain rights by creating other ones simply because of their evil consequences. In other words, starting from the assumption people have certain rights, Nozick constructs a theory which, when faced with the reality of unfreedom and domination, it would create for the many justifies this unfreedom as an expression of liberty. In other words, regardless of the outcome, the initial assumptions are what matter. Nozick's intuitive rights system can lead to some very non-intuitive outcomes. And does Nozick prove the theory of property rights he assumes? He states that, quote, we shall not formulate it here. Moreover, it's not formulated anywhere in his book. And if it's not formulated, what is there to defend? Surely this means that his libertarianism is without foundation. As Jonathan Wolf notes, Nozick's libertarian property rights remain substantially undefended. Given that the right to acquire property is critical to this entire theory, you would think it's important enough to go into some detail or at least document. After all, Unless he provides us with a firm basis for property rights, then his entitlement theory is nonsense, as no one has the right to private property. It could be argued that he doesn't present enough he does present enough information to allow us to piece together a possible argument in favor of property rights based on his modification of the Lockean proviso, although he does not point us to these arguments. However, assuming that this is the case, such a defense actually fails. If individuals do have rights, these rights do not include property rights in the form that Nozick and many other libertarians and anarcho-capitalists assume and don't prove. Nozick appears initially convincing because what he assumes with regards to property is a normal feature in the society we're in. We'd, we would be given what we note here that, feebles argue, uh, that feeble arguments pass for convincing when they're on the same side as a prevailing sentiment. Similarly, both Murray Rothbard and Ayn Rand, who is famous for repeating A is A ad infinitum, do the same, base their ideologies on assumptions. You'll see more of this in section 11. Therefore, we see that most of the leading right libertarian ideologues base themselves on assumptions about what man or man is or the rights they should have, usually in the form that people have certain rights, 
because they're people. From these theorems and assumptions, they build their respective ideologies using logic to deduce the conclusions that their assumptions imply. Such a methodology is unscientific and indeed a relic of religious and pre-scientific society, but more importantly, can have negative effects on maximizing liberty. This is because methodology has distinct problems. Murray Roth, uh, I'm sorry, Murray Bookchin argues, quote, conventional reason rests on identity, not change. Its fundamental principle is that A equals A, the famous principle of identity, which means that any given phenomenon can be only itself and cannot be other than what we immediately perceive it to be at a given moment in time. It does not address the problem of change. A human being is an inf infant at one time, a child at another, an adolescent at still another, and finally a youth and then an adult. When we analyze an infant by the means of conventional reason, we're not exploring what it is becoming in the process of developing into a child. In other words, right libertarian and anarcho-capitalist theory is based upon ignoring the fundamental aspects of life, namely change and evolution. Perhaps it will be argued that identity also accounts for change by including potentiality, which means that we have the strange situation that A can potentially be A. If A is not actually A, but only has the potential to be A, then A is not A. Thus, to include change is to acknowledge that A does not equal A, that individuals and humanity evolves, and so what constitutes A changes. To maintain identity and then to deny it Seems strange at the very least. That change is far from the A is A mentality, can be seen from Rothbard, who goes so far as to state that, quote, one of the notable attributes of natural law is its applicability to all men, regardless of time or place. Thus, ethical law takes its place alongside physical or scientific natural laws. See the Ethics of Liberty, page 42, if you want this citation. Apparently, the nature of man is the only living thing in nature that does not evolve or change, according to Rothbard. Of course, it could be argued that by natural law, Rothbard is only referring to his method of deducing his, and we stress they are just his, not natural ethical laws. But his methodology starts by assuming certain things about man. Whether these assumptions seem far or not is... Beside the point, by using the term natural law, Rothbard is arguing that any actions that violate his ethical laws are somehow against nature, but if they were against nature, they could not occur. We'll discuss this more in section 11. Deductions from assumptions is a Procrustean bed for humanity, as Rothbard ideology shows. So, as can be seen, many leading right libertarians and so-called anarcho-capitalists place great store on the axiom A is A, or that man has certain rights simply because he is man. As Bookchin points out, such conventional reason doubtlessly plays an indispensable role in mathematical thinking and mathematical sciences, and in the nuts and bolts of dealing with everyday life, and so is essential to understand or design mechanical entities. But the question arises, is such reason useful when considering people and other forms of life? Mechanical entities are but one small aspect of human life. Unfortunately for these people, and unfortunately for the rest of humanity, they do believe this, but human beings are not mechanical entities. They're living, breathing, feeling, hoping, dreaming, changing, living organisms. They're not mechanical entities, and any theory that uses ra reason based on such non-living entities will flounder when faced with living ones. In other words, this theory treats people as the capitalist system tries to, namely, as commodities, as things. Instead of human beings whose ideas, ideals, and ethics change, develop, grow, 
Capitalism and capitalist ideologues try to reduce human life to the level of corn or iron by em emphasizing the unchanging nature of man and their starting assumptions and rights. This can be seen from their support for wage labor, the reduction of human activity to a commodity on the market. While paying lip service to liberty and life, right libertarianism justifies the commodification of labor and life, which within a system of capitalist property rights can result in the treating of people as a means to an end in uh, <laughs> treating people as a means to an end as opposed to an end in themselves. As Bookchin points out, quote, in an age of sharply conflicting values and emotionally charged ideals, such a way of reasoning is often repellent. Dogmatism, authoritarianism, and fear seem all pervasive. This ideology provides more than enough evidence for Bookchin's summary with its support for authoritarian social relationships, hierarchy, and even slavery. This mechanical viewpoint is also reflected in their lack of appreciation that social institutions and relationships evolve over time and sometimes fundamentally change. This can be best seen from property. Right libertarians and so-called anarcho-capitalists fail to see that over time, in the words of Proudhon, property changed its nature. Originally, the word property was synonymous with individual possession, but it became more complex and turned into private property, the right to use, uh, use it by his neighbor's labor. The changing of use rights to capitalist property rights created relations of domination and exploitation between people absent before. For the right libertarian and, uh, and so-called anarcho-capitalists, both the tools of the self-employed artisan and the capital of a transnational corporation are both forms of property and so basically identical. In practice, of course, the social relations they create and the impact they have on society are totally different. Thus, the mechanical mindset of right libertarianism and anarcho-capitalism fails to understand how institutions like property evolve and come to replace whatever freedom enhancing features they had with oppression indeed von mises argues that there may be possibly a difference of opinion about whether a particular institution is socially beneficial or harmful but once it has been judged by whom we ask beneficial one can no longer contend that for some explicable reason it must be condemned as immoral liberalism page 34 so much for evolution and change Anarchism, in contrast, is based upon the importance of critical thought, informed by an awareness that life is in a constant process of change. This means that our ideas on human society must be informed by the facts, not by what we wish was true. For Bookchin, an evaluational of convention, uh, conventional wisdom, as expressed in the law of identity, is essential. And its conclusions have, quote, enormous importance for how we behave as ethical beings, the nature of nature, and our place in the natural world. Moreover, these issues directly affect the kind of society, sensibility, and life ways we wish to foster. Bookchin is correct. While anarchists oppose hierarchy in the name of liberty, right libertarians and these so-called anarcho-capitalists support authority and hierarchy all of which deny freedom and restrict individual development. It is un this is unsurprising because the right libertarian ideology rejects change in critical thought based upon scientific method and is so is fundamentally anti-life in its assumptions and anti-human in its methods. Far from being an actually libertarian set of ideas, these right libertarian ideas are a mechanical set of dogmas that deny the fundamental nature of life, namely change, and of individuality, namely critical thought and freedom. Moreover, in practice, their system of capitalist rights would soon result in extensive restrictions on liberty and authoritarian social relationships. We'll cover that more in section two and three. A strange result of a theory proclaiming itself libertarian but one consistent with its methodology. From a wider viewpoint, such a rejection of liberty 
by right libertarians is unsurprising. They do, after all, support capitalism. Capitalism produces an inverted set of ethics, one in which capital, dead labor, is more important than people, living labor. After all, workers are usually easier to replace than investments in capital. And the person who owns capital commands the person who only owns his life and productive abilities. As Oscar Wilde noted, crimes against property are the crimes that the English law, valuing what a man has more than what a man is, punishes with the hardest and most horrible severity. This mentality is reflected in right libertarianism when it claims that stealing food is a crime while starving to death due to the action of market forces, power, and property rights is no infringement upon your rights. It can be seen when right libertarians claim that, tax, that the taxation of earnings from labor, examples of $1 from a millionaire, is on par with forced labor. You can see Nozick for that citation while working in a sweatshop for 14 hours a day, enriching said millionaire does not affect your liberty as you consent to it due to market forces. Although, of course, many rich people have earned their money without, lab uh, without laboring themselves, um, their earnings derive from the wage labor of others. So would taxing those non-labor earnings be forced labor? Interestingly, the individualist anarchist Ben Tucker argues that an income tax was a recognition of the fact that industrial freedom and equality of opportunity no longer exist here in the U.S. in the 1890s, even in the imperfect state in which they once did. Which somewhat suggests a different viewpoint on this matter than Nozick or Rothbard would put forth. That capitalism produces an inverted set of ethics can be seen when the Ford produced the Pinto. The Pinto had a flaw in it, which meant that if it was hit in a certain way in a crash, the fuel tank exploded. The Ford company decided it was more economically viable to produce that car and pay damages to those who were injured or the relatives of those who died than to pay to change the invested capital. The needs for the owners of capital to make a profit came before the needs of the living. Similarly, bosses often hire people to perform unsafe work in dangerous conditions and fire them if they protest. Right libertarian and by extension so-called anarcho-capitalist ideology is the philosophical equivalent. Its dogma is capital and it comes before life, labor. As Bakunin once put it, you will always find the idealists in the very act of practical materialism, while you will see the materialists pursuing and realizing the most grandly ideal aspirations and thoughts. Hence, we see right libertarians supporting sweatshops and opposing taxation, for in the end, money and the power that goes with it counts far more in that ideology than ideals such as liberty, individual dignity, empowerment, creative and productive work, and so on and so forth for all. The central flaw of right libertarianism and by extension so-called anarcho-capitalists is that it does not recognize that the workings of the capitalist market can easily ensure that the majority end up becoming a resource for others in ways far worse than that associated with taxation. The legal rights of self-ownership supported by right libertarians does not mean that people have the ability to avoid what is in effect enslavement to another. Right libertarian theory is not based upon a libertarian methodology or perspective, and so it's hardly surprising it uh, in, in results it supports authoritarian social relationships and indeed, at the end of the day, slavery.